Okay, so let's see. Sorry, trying to do too many things at once. Anyway, uh, thank you again for joining us for the second uh, Baltimore History Evening of 2022. For those of you um, who may not have attended a Baltimore History Evening before, my name is Allison Seiler and I am a BC BCHS board member um, and tonight's Zoom host. So if you have any questions or need anything throughout the presentation, um, please feel free to send me a chat message um, or uh, raise your hand or you know I'll try to try to help you out if you have any trouble. Um, I'd like to start just by reviewing some of our sort of Zoom etiquette uh, things. So I use that term loosely. Um, we and then I'll actually turn it over to our host uh, Mike Fritch to in introduce our speaker for this evening. Um, I just ask that people remain muted during our presenters uh, um, presentation so that we can all hear and learn from him together. And I promise that later on, you'll have the opportunity to um, join in a discussion and a question and answer session at the end. So there will be time for you to unmute and say your question, um, or you can certainly feel free to type your question into the chat while the presentation is ongoing or at the end of the presentation. Um, and Yes, I think that's everything. <laughs> um, and I'll moderate the question and answers. So if you wanna raise your hand or if you wanna just unmute or let me know you have a question, that's also fine. So we'll do that at the end of the presentation. Um, and then lastly, like I said, if there's anything that comes up um, and you have a question or need something, just drop anything, drop that in the chat for me. Uh, so with all, with all of that, um, I'm gonna actually turn it over to Mike now to introduce our speaker. And again, thank you all for joining us. Um, it looks like we've got quite a, quite a crowd and I'm just imagining us all in the village learning place together. So that's where my mind is. Thank you, Allison. And welcome everybody to the, the second Baltimore History Evening of 2022. And I, gee, I, I don't know how many this is since we've been doing this since 2009. So at least six a year since then. Uh, thank you, Allison. Allison Seiler is one of the people who helped make this possible, along with uh, committee, uh, Savannah Woods and David Armente uh, and myself constitute the Baltimore History Evening Committee. And we're all board members of the Baltimore City Historical Society. The Baltimore City Historical Society is an all volunteer organization devoted to the public history of bringing out public history to, devoted to the history of Baltimore City. And uh, the main thing we do is, is programs like this. And we do this without charge. Uh, doesn't mean we ha don't have expenses. We'd like to thank Trace Architects, who is one of the sponsors of this series. Uh, that's the firm of our president, Heather Hairston. Thank you, Heather. And thank you, your partners in that wonderful architectural firm. Uh, you too could be a partner in making this happen. Uh, we're at, this is our 25th year. If you'd like to make a $25 contribution uh, to the Baltimore City Historical Society, you can go to our uh, webpage, which we'll put in the address in the uh, already, it's already in, Allison beat me to it. It's in the, in the chat. Uh, we do this the, every third Thursday of the month from January through June. And so before I introduce Dean, let me uh, give you a teaser about next month, which because of the magic of the calendar is also on the 17th of the month. And it's also about food. Hannah, uh, Kara Mae Harris, who's uh, a historian of Mary, Maryland food, is giving a talk entitled Cuisine a la Maryland, Historic Recipes of Baltimore's homes, hotels, and street corners. So I invite you to, uh, you know, make a bowl of snacks and join us for that. But tonight we have as a treat Dean Kimmel of the, um, he's actually one of the few people who, you know, we have speakers who kind of has to earn their own living. It's not an employee of a university or other institution. He is the uh, principal of Creative Museum Services. He is a longtime museum exhibit designer and person who thinks of how to convey history. 
people who go to places. Uh, he's designed exhibits for the Sports Legends Museum, for the 9-11 Memorial at the Baltimore World Trade Center. He's done exhibits at the Baltimore Museum of Industry, the Jewish Museum, and all sorts of other places. But rather than spending all this time talking about Dean, I'm just going to turn the, the spotlight over to Dean, and Dean can tell us about Lexington Market. Thank you, Dean, for being with us tonight. Well, you're welcome. It's good to see. It's good to see all the squares. Um, hello, everybody. I'm going to uh, hit the share screen and roll right into uh, right into slides. Um, let me. Um, here we are. Um, if uh, assuming everybody can see this, somebody who can't, That's let me good. know. Yep, all set. So um, the title the title of my talk is. Uh, Eden of Epicure, Baltimore's Lexington Market. Um, it it's it grows out of a project called the Lexington Market Public History Initiative, and it was a a project that was initiated uh, by by a combination of Lexington Market people, Seawall Seawall the developer, and then Johns Hopkins and Chris. Kristen um, Mitchell, who was at the Market Center at the time, Johns Hopkins of Baltimore Heritage, um, got a grant uh, through the Maryland Center for History and Culture from the Miller History Fund mm -hmm. to do some research, and it was a two-pronged thing, to do some research on Lexington Market, kind of document the history as much as we can, but also to gather, um, my charge was to, to, to find out where the info is, not the bodies buried, but where, what, what sources are out there beyond what we kind of know, um, what sources are out there to understand Lexington Market and to pull them together in kind of a digital community archive. Um, and um, so that, what I'm gonna do tonight is show you kind of what I found mixed in with the history of the market. Um, I also wanna say that the, uh, I should mention the Peel Center, uh, did sto a storytelling component that was funded by the uh, by that grant, uh, and I, I want to throw a special thanks to Rob Schoberlin, a Baltimore City archivist, uh, acting, but uh, Mr. Baltimore, who um, who just came through time and again with with materials, uh, and the same goes to all the archivists and librarians out there. Um, nobody can do this work without all of you and um, all of us who do this kind of public history, academic history, historical research uh, are in your debt. Um, so let me start with a couple, a couple of grand statements. Uh, I'll read things just so if anybody's just listening um, and I'll try to describe the photographs and, and the images that I've used because I'm, I'm a show and tell person. So I've got a ton of material to show you. Um, and what I, um, what I wanna do is I, I wanna talk a little bit about a big picture, just briefly about the history of the markets in Baltimore, then go into the Lexington, Mar Lexington market itself and really ramble on roughly chronologically over 200 years, but shortchanging the, probably the recent past in the last 50 years, because it seems that that is more in our living memory and we can all talk about that. Uh, and then we'll have the Q and A. So uh, first quotation from Helen Tangiers, who's an old Peel Museum employee that I knew in the early eighties, who wrote a, uh, several books about public markets, if you're interested. Uh, and her um, quote I use is, the public market is our society's conscience the place where we can evaluate our success or failure at organizing urban life. Big picture stuff in America, markets in, in the 18th and 19th century America. And the second quote comes from the Baltimore Sun, uh, like all the local newspapers, it's the steady source of information and kind of views on the market. Um, and there's a little something from the summer of 1873, Saturday market at Lexington, uh, the Saturday market at Lexington Market House will afford to the curious more perfect view of human nature in all its phases than any other locality in Baltimore. So off we go. But first, a little, uh, throw, I'll throw a little prompt out there for all of you to think about um, the personal angle of Lexington Market beyond the history, beyond the grand things I'm talking about um, is most of us, probably all of us on this call have some kind of personal relationship with the market. It means something to us. So um, you can all start thinking about Lexington Market is, what does it mean to you? Where, where you know, Lexington Market is where I do something or another. Um, that's me on the right with those gorgeous oysters at uh, Fadley's. Something I haven't done, we haven't done in a long time. 
All right, um, let me go into the big picture because to understand Lexington market, at least in my, my, my mind, you always have to have some kind of bigger context. Um, and what I'm gonna do in the next couple of minutes, just very quickly run through the, the history of public markets in Baltimore. And we're gonna start, in, it runs from 1765. And the last one was built in 1885. Uh, they're numbered on the screen. This is an 1887 map. Um, I started with number one, even though it was only about 20 years, it lasted about 20 years, but it is the first, first public market to in Baltimore town. You know, Baltimore is, is, is established in 1729. In the 1760s, there are a couple hundred people, several hundred people living here, maybe, you know, maybe a thousand. Somebody could probably correct me. Uh, and there's a need for a public market. And that, that's number one on the map. It's built at, uh, in, it's open and sanctioned and regulated by 1765 at Baltimore and Gay Streets. Um, <clears throat> tw fast forward 20 years, numbers two, three, and four are open within, really within a matter of months. Number two is, is Hanover Market on the west side. Uh, number three is Center Market, Marsh Market, um, where Port Discovery is today and that in a building that was a later, uh, you know, later building of that fish, a fish market building, uh, same site. And number four is the Fells Point Market, uh, now Broadway Market. So these are, these are built in and opened in 1785 to 86, the beginnings uh, of a growing town. Uh, Baltimore is still not a city, uh, but it's a growing town with dispersed, relatively speaking, dispersed population around the harbor and uh, markets are open. Um, I'll point out number two, um, Hanover Market was built on land that was bought by from Johnny Gerhard, Howard, whose father um, uh, left him with hundreds of acres of land around Baltimore. And that's on what was called Howard's Hill at the time. Um, Howard was a land developer and speculator who, who took his uh, inheritance and started to created early Baltimore on that west side of town. So that's number uh, two, three, and four. Number five is Lexington Market. And I'll go into detail about the, the origins of it, but that Lexington Market opened in 1806. Number, um, the second, the next market in the early 1800s, there's, a, there's, there's several new ones in that. Lexington is the first in 1806. Number six is Bel Air Market, 1819. Uh, in the 18, early in the 1830s, there's um, Richmond Market is number seven in the northeast on the edge of, of Utah, uh, now Bolton Hill. Uh, the building is still there. It is Uh, so number eight, Holland's Market was built in the mid late 1830s, 1838. It was rebuilt after its roof was blown off, um, and it um, it opens in on that west side of town, number eight. Uh, and Holland's is the one that is architecturally and physically the most intact. It looks like a 19th century market. That uh, it has a uh, an 1860s, a later a later building, a two story building uh, that is uh, that is still intact. So. Um, the Ninth Market down south, Cross Street Market opened in 1846. Um, and then about 13 years later, number 10 over on the east side of town, Hannah, uh, uh, Canton, is the uh, Canton Market on the Canton Square, uh, which opened in 1859. So before the Civil War, there is a series, I'll stop there for a moment, there's 10 markets. Um, and it's, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's very revealing when you look at the, um, when you look at their locations, if we overlay the population of kind of the size of Baltimore, most other than the first four, the, the others are on the edges of the, of, of the city at that time. They really are, um, they are kind of like suburbanization later when you have a shopping center built with just as housing is being built. They're, they are not built in populated areas. They're built in areas that then become populated. Um, so they are both anticipating growth and also satisfying people who uh, suddenly live further away from the markets than they want to. So this is, uh, this is up to the Civil War, the 1860s. There's the final two markets, the numbers 11 and 12 are the farthest out. Uh, 11 is Lafayette Market, uh, which opened in uh, 1871, 72. And the final market in the system is uh, Northeast Market over west of, uh, uh, east of Johns Hopkins Hospital Complex, number 12, 1885. So, 
what we have here over a hundred years, especially in 1780s, those, those, those next, the, the, you know, two, three, and four, a hundred years, a market system being built uh, uh, for a city that by the 1880s, by, by 1890s, is a 400 plus thousand people. Um, so that's the, that's the big picture. So let's dive into uh, Lexington Market. And here's a, uh, this is a map of uh, Baltimore in 1801. Uh, and I circled, um, I circled the Hanover, um, Hanover Market on the left, Center Market in the middle, and, and Broadway or Fells Point Market on that, on the uh, right. And then I, what I did, I put an X on to the Lexington Market, the Lexington Market area. That was the Western Precincts. Um, by the, by 1797, Baltimore is incorporated as a city, but its city limits uh, stop just about where Utah Street is. And the residents of this growing area over there um, in the late 1790s, they start to say, we need a market. We want a market over here. So by 1804, and the market, the, mar the creation of the markets is done through, it's in, in the early days, it's done through the General Assembly. Um, and, uh, and then once Baltimore City is incorporated, Baltimore City maintains its own markets. But Lexington Market is outside the limits of the city, it's in the county. Um, so the Western Precincts, which is a, an area of Baltimore County, uh, the commissioners are appointed by the, uh, by the um, commissioners are appointed by the General Assembly. And they, they acquire land, in two different, uh, uh, two different uh, purchases, one from John Eager Howard uh, and another from uh, Christian Keener and, and Englehard, Englehard, uh, Englehard Yeezer, uh, two bits of land, and they uh, they get they are authorized to acquire land to uh, start a lottery to fund this new market, and then to ultimately to set the rules and regulations. And what happens with Lexington Market, which happens everywhere around Baltimore, is as soon as an announcement is made and there's an act in the act, as soon as the activity begins to to create this market people uh, suddenly land values rise and people want to be near a new market. So here's a, here's a couple uh, examples of how every market, not only uh, the new markets sit on the edge of, 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 of settlement, uh, the, built in, the built up city, but they also then become an economic engine and an anchor to, to, to create a um, commercial center and, and raise the uh, property values around them because they are, they're sure to become a place of commerce on a, um, and um, intense development. Lexington Market, we, we, can, we can ask, you, uh, I'm sure if, if you, we all know, well, let me say this, the, the elephant in the room. Um, the, the one of the things that I, I suspected was that Lexington Market was, and I kind of knew this over the years, was not a market in the 1780s, does not have, it has these mythic origins in the 1780s, but I wanted to nail down what, what do we mean by a market and when when did it open and, and how does it relate to the other markets? So um, I'd spent a lot of time and did a lot of digging into the um, in land records and, and the, the newspapers and, and, and I've you know kind of come down on the side of Lexington market is not a 1780s market, no matter what was happening there. It is a market that's built that was built and opened in the 1806. The rules and regulations that 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 the Western precincts commissioners uh, with the General Assembly's blessing uh, put into effect, this were the same that uh, other markets in Baltimore City had, and they were a mile long. There's rules and regulations governing market days, several days a week, times, and they change seasonally, um, the rules on how to sell, what to sell, and where to sell it. Uh, the clerk had, uh, the clerk is in charge of weights and measures. It's very heavily regulated. This is, goes back to Helen Jane Gere's quote about the public conscience. It's really serious business having a market. It's not just a, a uh, well, it's like farmer's markets today and other, you know, when you think about it, they're very heavily um, administered. So uh, you don't just walk in and set up a, uh, uh, pull your wagon, set up a stand and, uh, and, 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 call, and, and uh, participate in a public market. So the, um, in June of 1806 is what I would say is the uh, beginnings of Lexington Market as an entity. Um, <clears throat> and here's a, here's a plat from 1818, um, soon after that. So um, I should say, I should have said, it's it's not Lexington Market when it was opened. It's called Western Precincts Market because it's in that Western Precincts. But when Baltimore uh, City annexed land to the West and to the North in 1817, 1818, uh, Lexington, this, this Western Precincts Market 
became part of Baltimore cities and it was renamed Lexington Market. Uh, the street was already there, Lexington Street on the south side. Uh, you see Louisiana Street on the north side. The market is in the middle of the street. Um, and the, you could see that the original market, there's Utah Street to the right, uh, and the market house is between an alley and Topeka. So it's really Paca. Paca and Lexington is kind of the center of the market in the early days. So we have a market. Um, Lexington Market is, is, um, is launched in 1860. Becomes, it becomes this uh, renamed market in 1818. Um, here's 1822. There's, there's still a lot of open space. This is a Poppleton, this plan of the city that shows shaded in areas that if you've never seen these, shows where people, where, where dwellings and structures were existed. Uh, and the number 51 Lexington Market space, you can see it's, it's built around, but there's not much to the north. There's a little bit to the east and the west, but there's still a, quite a bit of open space. So what do we know about these markets? I'm going to I'm going to start to ramble now in my in my chronology, but I'll I'm going to like this period, the early years, the early decades from about 1820 to 1860s. The newspapers here. I want to mix a little bit of because ultimately I'm trying to tease people into becoming curious and doing more research on the market. So there's so many different avenues and venues uh, that I can only touch on briefly. Um, Newspaper articles that uh, describe the foods in the market, especially Christmas uh, and New Year's, and uh, with uh, turkey and canvas back duck and partridge uh, and eggs. Um, there's the butchers. The butchers are the princes. They are the, um, this is 1834 uh, butchers ad. Uh, and the butchers are one of the few people to advertise regularly in, in the early years before the Civil War in the, uh, in the newspapers. Uh, and often they do that when they've, when they've just gotten allotment of, of beef or mutton in this case and, and other goods. And well, another thing to, to um, point out uh, as we read these things is all of this material kind of sheds, sheds light on some curious um, and sometimes little known things and sometimes um, things that are worth following up on. And one is that the, the butchers often and many early of these stall owners, um, we call them merchants, they probably call themselves dealers or butchers, uh, or, or by their name, hucksters and so forth. Um, they, had, they had stalls, at, uh, especially the butchers, had stalls at, um, in different markets. They just weren't one market people. Uh, and they also often were, a, I found that there is a, there's a lot of family, there's a lot of brothers, uh, men, it's predominantly men, but, uh, and white men um, at this point, and prop, but not, um, uh, but not wholly, but there's an awful lot of families there. Uh, the one thing we don't, there's one thing that's really hard. Let me go back there for a minute. Um, part of my charge was to go, well, how can we learn more about the market in different eras? And, at what, and, and, and where are the records that will help us do that? Um, when it comes to understanding who was in the market before the 1860s, um, there's very little to go on. So I throw these out there just as teasers. Um, the merchants, because there were not records and they just don't survive, and the, and the newspapers only have a handful of things. It's really hard to say who is there. So these merchants, there's uh, we get we get a, a glimpse of some of the butchers. We get a glimpse of some of the food, some of the prices. Um, and then here, in an unexpected place, I came across Robert, who was an enslaved man who ran away, uh, sought his freedom uh, from um, the Marriottsville area, uh, about 10 miles out, where Governor Charles Howard, who just happened to be the son of John, John Eager Howard, who enslaved him and, and at least 30 or 40 other people on his, his plantation. Um, Robert, the freedom seeker, in this ad, they uh, usually called runaway ads, uh, it's noted that as I write this, as I pulled out to the left, this fellow has been for nine months past attending the Lexington Market in Baltimore with butter from Governor Howard's dairy. So he was entrusted, uh, as enslaved people were all the time, to run a stall uh, on behalf of, of uh, Howard. Uh, we don't know if it's a street stall or if it's underneath the uh, underneath the sheds. Um, and the other, the um, one of the reasons, um, as I say to people, there's a very specific reason that's mentioned in this ad, is if he has been in that market for nine months and he has a as he fled to Baltimore, there's a lot of people who know what Robert looks like. So it's a, um, it's a shrewd uh, maneuver on the part of Howard to, um, to broaden his reach into regaining um, this enslaved man. Don't know what happened to Robert. Um, I, when I read these things, I always say, okay, I always say a silent prayer, please. I hope you escaped. 
Um, but um, but any, at any rate, it shows the the market is uh, it's it's not just a wholly white um, enterprise. Um, the other another question uh, that I looked into um, and was curious about was the um, idea that enslaved people were sold at markets. Um, I in my earlier research I didn't come across much. Someone had found this years ago in the Sun or the Baltimore American. Uh, it is from eight, and I, I followed up on it and did a lot of other research to see is this um, uh, were there other is there other evidence? Uh, this is Rosetta, who's a young woman, um, and um, this is the sole notice I found in uh, Baltimore papers that are digitized, and and many of them are, but not all, um, of someone being. Um, sold literally at the market. Now, where on, the, on that market space, we don't know. Um, and the, uh, the, the circumstance was the man named Samuel Gaskin who had gone bankrupt uh, and his goods, his property and, and Rosetta would have been considered his property uh, were, uh, were sold at auction. Again, there's nothing, I have no idea what happened to Rosetta. It was an awful time to be, uh, to be uh, sold um, uh, out of Baltimore. Um, these, uh, the whole other story about, um, the major slave traders in Baltimore at this point are, are selling people down the river, literally down the river to Louisiana, to Texas, to the large, large plantations. So we don't know what happened to Rosetta, but it is an instance when, when by public, um, uh, that, that there was a public sale at the market somewhere. Um, there were auctioneers around the other market spaces and around Lexington Market. Um, most sales of people, enslaved people in the early days before 1820, were probably private. By the 1820s and 30s, there were these major traders like Wolfric who had, um, and Campbell, uh, who had these monument, you know, these massive enterprises. Um, and so this is, a, this is a different kind of occasion, but it is, a, it is an instance um, of, of, uh, of a sale. Um, so let me move forward into the 1850s. Um, this is 1852. This is a similar map. This is a Poppleton map, the shading in area. If you think about that 1822, this area is completely filled. Uh, 1850s, Baltimore has 150, 160,000 people. The market is three sheds long. Um, it's, it's, full, it's full market space. Um, I won't read all this to you, but I wanted to show you a little bit and give you a sense of scale. Uh, and two things are happening here. Um, this is the market stalls and they're by type. Um, and this reflects the different types of stalls and the locations. I throw this on, I, throw, I put this on in here late, belatedly, um, because I thought uh, it's really, it opens up the idea that I'm not getting into how the market is laid out um, and literally where else beyond the sheds, these buildings in the market space, where else were people selling on market, on market day? Uh, the other thing is the growth of the market. The 1854 number, 475 stalls. I don't know if that includes, it, perhaps that didn't include the, the um, outdoor stalls. Um, by 1865, there's almost 1,200. So the, um, just quickly, if people have questions uh, later, we can talk about that, but there's, 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 in the, in the sheds, the butchers are generally on the center center aisle. Then there's permanent permanent uh, aisle, permanent stalls. The eve is where the, the edge of the market meets the street. Remember, they, up until the 20th century and even the 20th century, they're mostly open. It's miserably hot, miserably cold in bad weather. Uh, fish market is, uh, almost every market, fish markets were separate buildings. Uh, movable and space stalls are literally on the streets. And then you see a series of street names. This gives you a sense, I'll show you a picture in a minute, gives you a sense of how vast the market was uh, beyond these, just these sheds. Uh, and the other thing to note is the female, female headed, female owned or uh, occupied stalls. Uh, there's 150 of them in Lexington Market. It's not a high percentage, it's almost 13%. Um, the fish is, uh, is, is notable. Um, that there's a one in about one in five, um, not one in five, but one in one in four, one in three, uh, are women women owned. Um, again, newspaper articles on um, are they're not regularly touting and describing what's sold at the markets, but when they do, particularly in, sometimes in the summer, you know, it's seasonal, uh, spring summer, especially in Thanksgiving or Christmas. But when they do, they're rich with uh, rich with detail about where people are selling, what, what's being sold. Um, in this case, 
butter, eggs, potatoes, apples, peaches, nothing, nothing surprising. But, uh, but again, it's uh, depending on the era. And the one thing I've learned is you can't generalize over time. It's the thing that what, what is true for the 1840s or 50s might not be true for the 1870s, for the 1900s. But um, so it's, it's a, uh, yeah, I'm scratching the surface when I do this kind of stuff. Um, fast forward, 1869, after the Civil War, this is, this is, Think about the, uh, the list of all those different sheds. This is a bird's eye view, detail. And you see the uh, Utah Street on the right, the shed. Utah to pack up, pack it a green and then green to Pearl Street. The uh, fish market is on the far left, Pearl Street, the smallest, uh, and these other two sheds. But all of these streets around here, Utah all the way down to, to almost to Baltimore Street, or at least, at least to Fayette, and then north to Saratoga Street. Pack a street up to Saratoga down to Fayette. Pearl Street, the same. Uh, Green Street, the same. These on market days are full of, um, of uh, stalls. Busy places. This is a view, same period. It might be the earliest photo of Lexington Market. I'm not sure. I think it's close. It's owned by the market uh, they had in their collection. Um, the photographer, Rodney Crowther, had a, a studio at the corner of Howard and, uh, and Lexington, and he took this, I'm pretty sure he took it out of his studio window. We're looking west. The picture on the left is not a market day. Market day is Tuesdays, Tuesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, or Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays. It varied over time. Uh, it's usually three days and especially Saturday. Um, and then there's market day. And this is the block, this is the block to the east. This is Howard Street over. So again, it gives you a sense as many of these photographs that, we, that you've seen probably uh, online, give you a sense of the sprawl of the market and how, just how busy it was. And um, same period. The other part of the history, the architectural history and the construction history of the market is just one, it's, it's one long construction project. This is the, about 1860, 1970, 71, the market at Utah was rebuilt. Um, and it, uh, it's, it's similar, the pictures I've just shown you. So it's this, um, it's a constant um, enlargening and a rebuilding and roofing and uh, paint jobs and maintenance. Um, I, what I didn't say is that the city, the city collected revenue from of, of rents and 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 um, of rents and licenses. It did not when when these markets were sold were were built. Most of the stalls were sold. They were sold as private property. They were sold as an entity that you could literally sublet or sell to someone else. Um, so the the revenue that came into the markets, which become an issue in the 20th century. Was that these um, the merchants owned the land that they? It's kind of like row houses. They owned the land they sat on. Um, I'm going to jump forward to um, another uh, a view from the 1870s. Again, close ups, the detail and the fabric of Market Day. People coming in with their truck farms, their wagons. Uh, later on, they come with the trucks. The farmers who were around. Um, the um, probably just as many people were. Um, working with commission merchants and uh, seafood dealers were working with commission merchants. Uh, fruits and vegetables people were working with commission merchants. So it wasn't all farmers, it was not a farmer's market, but there was a, you know, a large, large number of people coming in from there, um, from the surrounding county, uh, Anne Arundel, Baltimore, um, Carroll to some extent, um, even, even Hartford maybe, but generally not to Lexington. I think the West Side folks would probably stay with the West Side. Um, these documents, the one on the left is from a block book. It's a land record. And the one on the, the documents on the right are the census records. And I was, what, when I mentioned before that these, this land was, the stalls were sold. They literally were bought and sold and then they were mortgaged. Um, what I found on the left was this, uh, this Richard Hartmeyer, who's a, who's a butcher. And these are his census records from 1860 and 70. He was a longtime butcher. He took out a mortgage in the 1870s uh, from the Baltimore Butcher's Loan and Annuity Association on his stall. Private property, your business, not just your business, but your, your, your stall itself. The records, um, the records um, suddenly, well, suddenly, the surviving records are, um, give us a pretty good window into the, from about the 1860s, about the 1890s with, the, with lists of merchants. Um, these are just, uh, these, these are some excerpts from the fish stalls from 1876, 1890. 
There are very, these are the Baltimore City Archives. They're very incomplete, but they're, I throw, I, here's another thing I'm throwing out there for someone to go jump onto. Um, there's, there's more research to be done. I, uh, all I did was gather it and kind of cite it. Um, but there's um, literally a path into understanding much more about who these merchants were, how long they were in business, were they really, were they family businesses, were they in there, were they, were they hit, were they, uh, who was running them, were they businesses that lasted for generations or were they not, and did that change over time, all those big history questions. Um, the, um, the other thing we can tease out is, so you can start to get some bio, some, some bios, and you can, with a, with a little bit of research, you can understand a little bit more about people uh, and who they are, and this is, this is Sophie, a woman named Sophie Mitchell, um, she shows up on on a red, on the list of uh, stall owners of the fish stall uh, in um, 1876, and um, there's a census record when she was earlier when she was with her husband John Mitchell, who was who had died um, and left her a widow, and she was in her 40s. Um, her um, one of her descendants, Sharon uh, Lina Pierce, sent me uh, material on her. Um, she was a Scottish uh, immigrant who came to Baltimore as a, a child. She married at 20. She was widowed in her 40s. She ended up um, having a business for about 20 years that um, uh, fish stall and then produce and vegetables that she passed on to her grandchildren before she died in 1883. Um, there's little, there are ways to tease out some of these, um, some of these stories about the merchants and family members. Went the wrong way. Um, Emily Smith, another woman. She's an African American um, produce. Uh, produce dealer who worked until her 80s. Um, Baltimore woman. She's on the list on the left. Emily J. Smith is her. She has the Eve stalls. She's in the market for 40 years, uh, working until uh, she passed away in 1911. She's working until 1904. She was also widowed. Um, and uh, that's a question about where, where many, of the, many of the women who went into this were they widowed uh, and in, in, in need of income. Um, James Herndon, another African-American uh, merchant, and there are not many, and uh, my ears perked up when I found black merchants. I wanted to find out more about, um, about people who are little known and underrepresented. Herndon was a man who came from the South at about age 20 at the turn of the century. And for the next 60 years, he had, uh, for about 50, 60 years, he had a produce uh, stall at Lexington Market. His wife was his business partner, his, um, his, one son, his son, Ralph, um, worked with him, at the, but then by the early 60s did not uh, carry on the business. Um, more on food in the 1880s. The articles from 1880s on the coverage of the of the of the of the market gets a little bit more detailed. There are many, there are a couple more features. It's clearly a thing. It's it's an entity that is fascinating to Baltimoreans. So the uh, Sun and other newspapers. Um, we'll do regular, especially around, again, thanks of the holidays, regular uh, reporting, not only on the prices, but just on the uh, increasingly kind of feature stories on the, on, the, on, the, on the flavor of the market and what it's like. Now, by the turn of the century, ball, um, Lexington Market is a downtown market. This is 1906. It's a, it's a, a, birds, it's a, a plan of the city. It's an atlas. Uh, on Howard and Lexington Streets, there's the Hoshals or Stewart's, Brigger, um, Julius Gutman had a department store on Utah, which is gone now. Um, not Julius Gutman, but I um, can't think of his first name. Joel Gutman. Joel Gutman's, that was his, he was the first of the big department store uh, palaces. And um, this is Baltimore's downtown market. This is what it looks like. This is what's more familiar to us today through photographs, although obviously this market's gone, long gone, but it becomes uh, photographed incessantly and there's postcards. It's a landmark. Um, it's one of Baltimore's destination. It's a tourist, a place to bring out of towners. Uh, and it still gets 50,000 people on a, on a Saturday night uh, shopping. Um, let me run through some of the, um, some of the advertisements and, and some of the early 19th century when early 20th century when the, the evening sun starts to illustrate its, here's, Bald here's the first delicatessen uh, in 1915. It's not a lunch counter, but it's a place of smoked meats. Uh, promoting the wares in, in, in the um, evening sun with different merchants would have ads. These illustrated ads started to become popular and the whole market itself was advertised. If you go to the Lexington, if you go to the market today, 
if you wander around the streets, uh, and let me know if you've ever done it, the number on the side is from is from Lexington near Arch Street. That's the furthest west. There are about a hundred of these curb stones, uh, and they are from street stalls. And the granite stones are still there. Um, the the plan on the right is from 1916. It's literally a plan of every stall in the market with locations and numbers. Um, and it, if early, it's a way to say if if a photograph before before about the 1940s, you could see you could find out where a market where a stall owner uh, stall was because many of the pictures, of course, have numbers on them. So the 20th century. Let's um, I'm I'm gonna skirt, I'm gonna skate into the 20th century and 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 full and and you know coast into into question time. But the 20th century is that there's an ugly turn in the, in, uh, the coverage by after especially after World War One uh, when there's 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 suddenly people are angry. The market needs to be modernized. It's old. Uh, street stalls and automobiles are um, automobiles need more room in there. The city's congested. And people are arguing about the congestion on the market and the rats and the and it just looks awful. And then the street stalls and there's battles from 19, 1919 until the 1940s when they're outlawed and banned. Um, and there's new markets. There's dreams of new markets. Um, this is a 1929 drawing. It's published in 41. I'm not sure why it's published then, um, and just or republished. Um, but again, these these Lexington Market is a place of frustration suddenly by World War One, even though it has its charm and it still feeds Baltimore. Um, and at this point. In the 20s, the teens and 20s, there's a lot of names that we remember. So much of our sense of what the market is or was comes from the early 20th century and these names, which are, of course, are replaced for the most part. And if they're not replaced, they're, they're, the families are gone, uh, but the merchants um, carry on with their business, but they're not these family members anymore. The um, watershed event of course, our modern era begins in March of 1949 when the market burns. It's a major fire, burns overnight. Most of it was uh, the, the, uh, the uh, one of the sheds, just both the sheds were just, were, one shed was destroyed. The second one on the West was was torn down. Um, it was a, a, you know, a rat trap waiting to, a, a fire hazard waiting to happen. Um, and it destroyed the market and it paved the way for a new market that we're living with today. Uh, that sets the stage for this next. Um, this is the new market, air conditioning in the late 50s. The 60s and 70s for the market, I'm moving into kind of cultural history. It becomes a, a, a really era of nostalgia. And, uh, but it's also a source of information about, about, about the people who worked at the market and their family life and who they came, where they came from and how they ran their business. I remember columns were a staple of the 60s and 70s. Um, Fadley's the uh, the signature kind of the signature stall in the market, isn't it? Uh, Fadley and Son, uh, Smith and Fadley early on, um, and this is uh, this is two photos and the signature photo of um, Bill Devine on the right, married into the Fadley family, and that's the uh, signature. Then the new wave of the '70s is uh, Korean immigrants coming and finding a foothold and buying uh, stalls, initially buying the stalls of the retiring. Uh, merchants who had been around maybe for a couple generations, key off in many cases keeping the same name, but then increasingly uh, naming it for their uh, taking their own name and replicating that. Um, the other thing the market does is it's always been a place where not only politicians but people, a special social gathering place. Um, and this is Jesse Jackson in 1980. This is a tradition that goes back with politicians, public meetings, so forth, but place to be seen. And finally, um, the arcade. It's now historic, right? It's an historic, uh, uh, what do you call it? It's a memory, 40 years old now. Festival, it was the festival marketplace. Uh, my memory of it was, oh my God, what the hell do we, what are we doing having Harbor Place up here? But over time it became a, it became a public space. Entertainment, performance, my kids sang there. We went to hear music there. You'd have a beer, have, uh, it became a, the place to sit and hang around, didn't it? Uh, and then the future, back to the future is, the newest, the 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 this, this, the new build, the building that will open will harken back to the 19th century, won't it? Um, and uh, that is the end of my remarks for now. Thank you for uh, for listening. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and and let everybody kind of go <sighs> exhale.
from that. There's a resounding applause. Resounding applause. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Jean. I think you fit an incredible amount of information into, um, you know, 46 minutes or 40, probably 40 minutes because I talked a bunch at the beginning. Um, so I want to open the floor to folks' questions if they'd like to um, raise their hands or just unmute and ask or drop something in the chat. Um, I will start with one question that was in the chat um, and it came back a little, it was pretty early on and it was about um, Fadley's. So um, Fadley's is still operating in Lexington Market um, and uh, Barbara wanted to know if there was any special history of Fadley's maybe that you discovered in your research? You're putting me on the spot. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm pausing because I hate, what I found was Fadley's was a, um, John Fadley was a young man who came from West Virginia to Baltimore uh, and, um, worked for a couple of years as a oysterman and a shucker and some other things, and then went into the business of um, joined Smith and Fadley, joined a senior partner. Um, I don't know when, I don't think he was, I really sound like a prig here when I start talking about dates and, and earliest, but um, sometime, I think it was sometime in the 1890s and not the 1880s that we all talk about. I don't know if that matters to anybody. It's kind of like the founding of the, of the market, but the danger of doing research and archival research and digging into it, right, is, is finding out, well, things aren't, as, things aren't what we thought they were. And, but John Fadley was a man who went into the business with a senior partner who, has, who, was, um, who had a longer experience with seafood in dealing. Um, and he, he ended up creating a business that was passed on to his children and then grandchildren and what, three generations now. Um, and um, I've documented a little bit more about them, but not, not a lot. I think, their, I think their history is in general, I think the Fadleys understand and know the way they've run their businesses. There's, there's a ton more to know uh, that's in their heads and in their records about how they ran their business and changing food tastes and what they sold. Um, I kind of just looked around and, and was curious about the origins and how it all started when, when I came across like conflicting info. So that's not a very good answer. Um, if there's a follow-up to that about, about Fadley's itself, um, yep, somebody could, we should unmute and have a discussion about it, but. I think too, um, like you said, and I know at the beginning of this project, we talked about it, um, just people safekeeping and safeguarding their own stories and histories. And I think sometimes when you are a you know, um, public historian coming into those environments, um, you know, it, we're not trying to take anything, we're trying to tell stories. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll move on to our next question um, from Bev. Uh, they said, if we have a German immigrant ancestor who had a stall in Lexington Market in the late 1800s, is there a way to find out uh, what they sold and circumstances by name? Um, the later, yeah, I think I think in the late 1800s, you're you're better. You have a better chance. There are um, there's there's records. What I, what I would do is you can um, first you can you can look in city uh, and let me say this, virtually. Everything I did, I did online because of COVID-19. Uh, I did visit Maryland, Maryland Center for History and Culture and look at some photographs. But other than that, I did all this digging online. So you can, um, you can look at Baltimore City Directory's census records. You can search the, the, um, the, the Baltimore City Archives has uh, the records, the lists. Um, it, will give, it will give you a sense of what people sold. Uh, I don't know that it will, you know, it, it might say fish dealer. Um, or you might find out they were a, a butcher. Um, you may not, you know, learn through through most records beyond that. Um, excuse me. You you will though be able to get a better idea if you look at a bunch of directories when they were there uh, and how long they were there, or if they were in other markets. Um, so there's a and census records as well. So that's it's 
Yeah, there, there's, it's often fragments. It's often pulling them together and then going, okay, teasing them out and going, all right, what else can we learn? Um, Thanks, Dean. Um, and I'll drop a link to the city archives in the um, in the chat in a second. Um, lots of good feedback. Virginia uh, has also found one of the um, stall markers. I mentioned I found one during a Baltimore Heritage tour. Um, some gratitude. Bill Berry says, great presentation. Um, and then we have another question uh, from Beth. Was the market, uh, were the market stalls segregated in the early years? Uh, curious as to whether races only bought from uh, their race, stalls of their race. Um, I don't think, I, I don't think that, I think, well, generally speaking, public markets were, were reflected their society. I don't, I don't think there was racial segregation on market day or at other times, as far as being a, a shopper. Uh, if, 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 if I was black, when I went to the market, I would shop anywhere uh, as far, you know, as far as I know. Um, and in fact, I looked into the 20th century with, with the modern civil rights. I wondered about, uh, I think I found one reference to somebody saying Lexington Market is the only place as a black person I can eat. Um, but, but back to the shopping and, and social space it is still, there's still de facto, you know, de facto and de jour segregation, or at least racism, white supremacy. So marketplaces and like Lexington would have reflected that. Um, but there would have been no, um, yeah, as far as I know that, you know, the handful of black um, merchants, the, the produce dealers, I think their the customers were white and black. Um, yeah, I don't think there was any, um, um, yeah, any kind of barriers in that regard. Um, Thanks, Dean. Oh, you know, um, I yes. can also let me say this, Allison. I could, mm -hmm. I could send or I could send you, and maybe you could post it somewhere, a link to some the resources. I created a document called dis, like a discovery document, how to know more about Lexington Market, and perhaps we could, and, you know, we could share that. And that would have the list links to the city, you know, people who are serious about this city archives and, and photo photo uh, photo repositories and newspapers and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, that would be great, Dean. We can definitely share that um, with the audience tonight. Um, uh, Mike was wondering why Lexington Market achieved uh, iconic status, but other markets didn't. Good question. Um, it was Lexington Market. I th my hunch always was, maybe people have other ideas. It's location. Um, it, it, it was, it became location was one and size was another. The size, it was, it was by the middle of the 1800s, it was, it was almost as big as center market. And center market, if you, if you, you know, if you know that area um, on, 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 on um, marketplace was a sprawling complex, uh, marsh market, it was called in the 1900s. So Lexington market, and that it had a fish market, it had a horse market, it had all kinds of um, of, of, um, of entities to it. Lexington Market uh, grew to its three sheds. I think by the turn of the century with so much of the, especially the, um, I think it had to do with the department stores and the downtown, you know, Baltimore's real downtown emerged by the 18, late 1880s um, when the uh, Gutman's Palace building, the Hutzler's Palace building is two years later, Stewart's, Hoschel's, all those. That becomes the center. I think then Lexington Market becomes the downtown big market, uh, and which is why people, they were of two minds generally of its, one, one group wanting to modernize and the, mar the merchants didn't want to because they were afraid it was going to cost them money. But people were, they were both embarrassed but proud of it. Uh, that's Baltimore, I guess, right? By the turn of the century, it looks, it's, it's just ramshackle almost. I mean, it's, but it's, ra it's rambling, but it's not modern, it's not new. Um, so, um, but it becomes, becomes beloved. Um, and then I, then I think it must've been photogenic, right? The postcards do it. There's something to, something about the, um, something about a way I think uh, is then translated into postcards uh, and other views. Um, and it just spreads and that's why we, we have a we have a bias right now toward what we're used to seeing, um, so we're going like yeah that's none of the other, you know, the other markets don't exist because nobody took many pictures of them so um, yeah I think the market like the 
I guess the um, aesthetics of the market matter in, in certain ways and how that's reproduced. Um, let's see. So we have a few other questions in the chat. Um, Susan asked, yeah, go ahead, Garrett. Um, Dean, I had one other observation about the specialness of the Lexington market. I ate lunch there from 1965 through uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the 60s and 70s, it um, was also a favorite downtown luncheon place. So stockbrokers and lawyers and Baltimore's elite would walk over there for lunch. So it was half a lunch place, maybe more a lunch place. And it was a market. Um, the market stalls continued, but they generally uh, were in second place. But during those years, it had all sorts of innovations as a, as a lunch place. Mr. Barron decided to sell fruit that was already prepared. Uh, so you could go in and for 85 cents, get a nice bowl of fruit. Uh, Mary Mervis was the long time largest purveyor of sandwiches and corned beef on rye with mustard would be a standard. So Lexington Market in the 1960s and thereafter was half a lunch place. And I will tell you one story that I think is true. Somebody can check it out. There was an Utz potato chip, chip stand and all they did was sell us potato chips already bagged because they bagged them and sold them. And it seemed as hard to understand how you could make a living selling us potato chips, chips. But then they were federally indicted for selling guns. <laughs> so you, they sold guns on the side. The, uh, yeah. the other story I remember is as the market changed, historically early in the 60s, the Italians more or less monopolized uh, produce. But when the Koreans came in, they were expansionistic and hardworking and began to go into the uh, produce business. And there were stories of fights downtown in the basement between the new Korean produce sellers and the traditional Italians. Again, that's uh, more anecdotal than fact-based are probably more or less true. So those are some of my memories as a 40 year uh, daily customer of, a, of the market. Thanks. What about MDE? Thanks, Garrett. Um, yeah, you, you brought up, um, one is there, I think there's a lot to be learned with um, uh, more research, <laughs> oral histories and just discussions when people will talk. I'm glad you brought up, I, 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 um, I was remiss I really didn't talk about immigration much. The, the Italians, there's Eastern Europeans in the deli trades, Italians all over the produce trade beginning in the 1890s. Um, and the, the names that we know in the, in the 60s, 70s on, uh, Germans did, doc, did uh, dominate at, uh, the butchering. Although I, and I did a little study in the 1860s and many of them were native. They were first generation, they were second generation. They were, they were the children of immigrants. Um, so, th and I think probably things changed by the turn of the century there, the Germans were made, they were, you know, off the boat. Um, so there's, there's a, yeah, there's that. Oh, let me say something about the, the, uh, the, the lunch counters and the lunch places. In the 1930s, in 1933, there's 30 lunch counters at Lexington Market. And in late thirties, a local restaurateur sued the market and said that it should be illegal. You sh you can't. It's against the law for you to have lunch counters to be cooking in the market. There was an 1887 uh, um, ordinance that said cooking is not allowed. That had been invoked in the earlier to, in the 20th century by a peanut roaster against a peanut roaster said you can't cook. It was ignored. The lunch counter. Um, uh, battle in the in the courts in 18, 1938 uh, went in favor of the lunch counters who were then licensed. Uh, then there were delis. So yeah, there, there's a whole change. One of the things when I, I when I talk about markets, I think that 
there's change and continuity. Some things change and mirror the times. Some things stubbornly stay the same. And it's this interplay. So yeah, thanks, Garrett. There's there's a hell of a lot. There's so much more that all of us know about all of you. You know, you've been there. You've been going there for years. Uh, and I was a Mary Mervis guy myself. Um, but I I felt guilty about Barons. I'd go there once in a while. But um, so the, sorry, the Allison. Peanut you want to go ahead? Sand, the peanut stand was still in business. Constance, yes, yeah, so Constance is a Greek peanut on, stand. Yeah, on the yeah Constance goes back to the 1890s. Yeah, Constance some of them there, was still there. Yeah, some of them do reach back. Some, some, some of these, um, some are you know multi generations, three and four. Allison, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, I just want to make sure we get to folks' questions um, because I know we're, you know, near time. Um, so I think uh, let's see. There was a question from Susan. Um, how would one research a family member who had a stall there um, in the 20th century? Um, well, yeah, it's a good question. Similarly, um, depending on what what era of the 20th century, uh, there are there are there are um, city the records again. The market records are not very good, and Lexington Market has some. So it might they might be some records in Lexington Market. I start with things like city directories and see if they're listed. Directories and then phone books. Directories go up to the 1960s, 64, um, to see if there's a listing. Um, um, that's kind of where I start. Um, I would check the newspapers, but again, people don't advertise very much. It's pretty tough. Um, it's it's you can anybody's free to contact me too if they want to some you know follow up and have a conversation about how to dig a little deeper and find out info. Um, yeah, there's not yeah, really a I'll drop, great answer. I'll drop your email in the chat again. Um, I think that's a good option. Uh, and then Heather was wondering um, how many people responded when you put out the call for information and, and archival documents related to families and employees who operated the stalls? Um, not a lot. Um, I didn't, I found um, I, I, a couple people contacted me, only a handful. Um, and I know there's there's tons out there. Yeah, but um, yeah, I thought it was minor. Um, very small. Yeah, it's also yeah. a pandemic, so you know. Um, and then let's see. Hollow and Madeline asked, "Did major changes in the market parallel the use of electricity and refrigeration in people's homes?" Yeah, that's another another good point that I, I did you know I didn't go into, um, especially refrigeration. You know, uh, and again, part of the Part of the decline of the market is in the face of supermarkets or first off markets. You know, there's um, the one thing there's cities in the 19th, 18th, 19th century, especially have grocers, groceries on corners, but grocers sell tea. They sell, they sell tea, coffee. They, they don't sell, they're not corner grocers that are selling vegetables, but those markets of the 1920s, what, what will become supermarkets or small chains. First, the A&P grows into a supermarket, but there's other small chains that become having department like department stores of groceries um they introduce their their refrigerated uh their cleaner so they they reflect poorly on the markets the markets don't have refrigeration then they finally in the 1940s there is you know be, there's beginnings of, of refrigeration um so that these stalls but even then i mean the photographs you see of the markets in the 40s um it's really not until after the fire and and I should have also said this, there's fires in a couple other markets. Cross Street Market burns down in 51. Uh, Lafayette Market burns in 53. Again, fire traps. Um, after that is when modern markets are, are open and that's when refrigeration and the electrification comes in in a big way. Uh, before then, it's just cobbled together. Uh, the lights, the, uh, and the market, market days, markets were open during the day, but it's Saturday night. So, um, I mean, traditionally there had to be lighting uh, throughout some kind of lighting um, throughout the, its entire history at night on a Saturday. Um, but electrification, refrigeration, I think it's more, I suspect it's more toward it changes people's shopping habits. I think I traditionally used to say it was just a part of the decline of the market in terms of modern, modern department stores and consumer behavior changing. Yeah, I thought that question was really thoughtful. So thanks for that. Um, there is also a question about burger cookie stories. I wonder if you encountered any any burger cookies in your research. Um, not in this. Uh, George Burger 
there was one of the burgers had a stall at the market um, and um, they were, you know, the, the burgers were famous for their cakes before they were, I don't know, you know, I don't see much evidence of the cookies until much later. Um, but burgers were, you know, they were a, a family of bakers. Um, were, 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 the father was German. Uh, there were a couple brothers. Uh, and, uh, but I didn't, I, in, in Lexington Market, I did not come across much um, in the way. Again, probably a, a victim of, um, of COVID-19. I think this, this project in the the ongoing documentation of Lexington Market has to happen in the kind of in the flesh and and once you know, once we're we're uh, people are congregating and there's somebody has the ability to go out and uh, sustain way to contact people and to visit people and talk uh, and then public gatherings where we just share information about uh, about uh, about stalls uh, like Garrett's observations and memories. Yeah. Um... So I'm going to actually ask the last two questions in reverse order, because I think one is looking to the past and one is looking to the future. So um, Terry asked, did the rise of the trolley system in Baltimore influence the prominence of the market, of Lexington Market? I didn't hear the word, the, uh, the rise of what system? The trolley system. Oh, oh, streetcars. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, boy, let's see. You think of the streetcars, you think of transportation. Um, there's, there are, there's, there's, it's really, it's a 1850s. <sighs> there's not a, 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 a railway until 1859, the streetcar, the horse cars. Before that, there's omnibuses that are running. So 1850s, 1860s, by the time Baltimore is a growing city with a, you know, with a network of mass transit, um, the markets are pretty much in place. Then they, then of course they they did make getting to them easier. So I think they would have, if you think if you look at it, they probably have something to do with the people's particular habits. People on the west side could easily get to uh, Holland's Market uh, or Lexington, um, or even or hell, if they wanted to go to Richmond Market, they could go to Richmond. Depending, you know, you can get all over. We look at we drool when we look at those maps of uh, of uh, street for the streetcar system of Baltimore. Um, but I think I don't know that it. I don't know that it it had a direct impact, uh, or as much as the, you know, the markets themselves become anchors of neighborhoods and the streetcar streetcar systems go uh, serve them. Yeah. yeah, there's probably more to that answer, but I don't. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta gotta talk to our pals at the the BNO or the streetcar museum for that one. Um, I just wanted to close with this question from Bev, which I think is um, something probably most of us are curious about, and perhaps you know a little bit more than we would. Um, can you tell us what's happening with the renovations at Lexington Market now, and if there's an opening date? Um, I I don't know all that much. Um, I think I, I only know what I read in the paper and see online. Um, I don't know. So I don't know if is anybody does anybody have an opening? Anybody on on this uh, have an opening say, date? Feel free to feel free to it unmute. Was sometime in 2022, sometime this year. Um, the I've not I have not been inside, but uh, I think there certain the there are tours being offered, some kind of hard hat tours. Uh, I don't know how you get on one. Uh, I think there's some um, transform. If if people look look up um, transform Lexington online. Um, it is a, uh, you know, it's, it's a cross between what I've, what I've seen. I've only seen what's happening there um, in, you know, drawings and architectural renderings and things like that about, about the space itself. And I, why, and I see the, um, the merchant rollout. So there's traditional like Trinacria from up the street is going to have a stall there. And, and the Fadley's is, is, is trying to figure out whether or not they, they can have a stall there or are they going to be in their old place. Uh, and there's new merchants. Uh, there's some of the newer, you know, new young couples and um, who have businesses. And um, so there's a, it looks like there's a combination of like, thank you. I see that somebody put the transfer election to market um, in the chat. Um, yeah, there's a combination of, of, of what used to be called staples and, and just, you know, and other kinds of goods. Because when I, um, I started doing a tour, a bus tour of the markets in the 90s, I did it for about 10 in the 80s and 90s, I did for about 10 years. And there was always an argument, or an argument is always a, um, the issue for the market people is always that blend. 
like too many staples versus like Garrett's lunch counters versus like Northeast Market has all those places to eat because it serves all those people at lunch. But can the you know, market needs to have a lot of staples? So it'd be that I think the transform Lexington and the new development or the new market is going to have that. They have that same challenge. What is that? What is that mix? And you know, Baltimorean said like we don't want our house. We don't want a food court. We do need that blend and that mixture. Uh, and um, and we also want new faces in here. We want more black businessmen. There's more black business people. There are more people who are, are able to do this. So let's let's broaden it uh, because we were severely underrepresented in the past. So, um, but I don't know, is anybody, um, I don't it know if anybody like, here is involved with it directly. Um, yeah, Dean, I, I went on the website and it looks like the grand opening is 2022. So it appears that it's, um, that things are back up and running, but I haven't been. So I don't know if there's anybody in the in the Zoom room who has checked it out yet, but um, I guess we need to. <laughs> well, construction's going on. I mean, construction continued. I never, it never stopped, I know. Uh, right. But I don't know what uh, close they are. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, um, if people have further questions, I have put um, Dean's email in the chat for you. Um, you can also follow him on Twitter uh, to see what he's up to and what else he's doing. Um, and we will be uh, sharing a recording of the this evening's program on our YouTube page. I did drop the link in there as well, but you can also always visit BaltimoreCityHistoricalSociety.org for more information um, and, and links out to all of our um, different pages, like our Facebook page. Um, I'll just maybe hand it to Mike now for a closing thought, and then um, I will we'll end our meeting. Okay. Well, first, great thanks to Dean for this, uh, just in many dimensions. And one of this, this night, I think, illustrated um, one of the things that's been happened over the years, whenever we do these this kind of thing uh, on a fairly modern history topic, uh, at least within the range of experience of people who come in the audience, uh, it it fulfills one of the dreams we had when we first started this of an interactive discussion between the the guest expert, but the people in the audience who've had experiences. Uh, so people uh, such as Garrett Power, who is an emeritus professor at the University of Maryland School of Law, uh, and others of you who've contributed in the chat have had a lived experience of, of, of the you know, Lexington market in this case. And you've brought your, your history to our event. And so in that sense, you are also part of what makes this evening what it is. And so I very much, I thank Dean and I thank you. Uh, and just to know, Baltimore City just stopped. It's still going on. You're part of it. Uh, pay attention. Sorry, Mike. I'm trying to figure out who's unmuted. Sorry? I was just trying to figure out who, there was some feedback. Sorry for interrupting. Well, okay, well, that's all I have to say is. Hey, can I? Uh, Thank you, Dean, and thank you, everybody else. If anybody, if anybody is a funder out there and knows how to how to get money to do more work on this, I'd love to keep doing it. I haven't done because my my job is over. It's been gone, done for a year or so, but um, almost a year. But yeah, there's there's so much more to, to for us to learn. You you can thanks hire, everybody. You can hire Dean to do your family's private museum and you know immortalize your your family here in Baltimore. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? And, and always, Heather can I, design the museum for you. I always end I always end up finding things that we don't always want to know though. Yes. Well <laughs> except these days, you know, finding a you know, finding a little bit of a, you know, rogue in the family history makes it so much easier. Yeah. Uh, interest more interesting. So anyway, thank you everyone. Thanks See everyone for joining us. Thanks Next a lot. month, March 17th, we'll see you. more about food. Yep, we'll see you in March. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, You're everybody, welcome. for joining us. Have a great Thank evening. You. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.